stem cell, just one of those cells, that's sufficient to have the mouse survive and make all the different kinds of blood cells we saw in the previous slide. So that experiment shows really the power of a hematopoietic stem cell. And that power has been brought to clinical treatments, to medical treatments. Many of you will know of what is sometimes called bone marrow transplant. So these are given to cancer patients. Well, when a bone marrow is transplanted into a cancer patient after the patient has gone through radiation and chemotherapy treatment, it is the hematopoietic stem cell in the bone marrow, that's where it's found, which is, allows the patient to then survive. Now, how do one, does the animal or does one use these stem cells to replenish the different parts of the body? I've given an example and talked a bit about stem cells shown there at the top. But I now want to talk about other kinds of tissues, in particular the pancreas, which don't seem to use stem cells, but instead have in a sense a simpler but clinically yes, less useful mechanism, which is just to take the differentiated cells and have them divide. So let's think about the pancreas. Remember that it has a slower turnover rate. The cells uh, live for many months to years. But nevertheless, there is some turnover. The, the organ is not static. And that is emphasized here in this picture. These little bubbles are showing us cells dying and then being replaced. Now here in this slide, it would seem like it's happening every few seconds. In fact, it takes months for this to happen. But during your lifetime, this will go on. Your pancreas is being renewed. Now, in an interesting experiment called the Pulse Chase experiment, we tested for whether there were stem cells involved in that replacement or whether there was some other mechanism. And I'm going to describe that experiment to you in some detail. It was done by my colleague, Yuval Dorr. And it's a little bit complicated, but I'm sure you'll be able to understand it. It involves genetically labeling cells and then watching what happens to them if you wait for some period of time. So it's called the genetic pulse chase experiment, and this is how it's done. The circle there is intended to represent one of the pancreatic islets that I showed you earlier. So here the islet, uh, we're pretending that it only has one kind of cell, this pancreatic beta cell, the insulin-producing cell. And it's shown there on the left. And the key part of this experiment is to label cells at the beginning of the experiment, at time zero, or at the pulse, and label them in such a way that they will express an enzyme that we can then use to stain the cells blue. The enzyme is called placental alkaline phosphatase. And it's arranged in this case so that the only cells that will express this enzyme are those that are already fully differentiated. And that's an important point. They are cells that are expressing the insulin gene and are fully functional beta cells. So we label them at this period. And then we're going to wait to see what happens. So let's consider the two possibilities. Since the cells in the islet are turning over, if the blue and the yellow cells die they're, and they're replaced by a stem cell, that stem cell would not have been marked because it wasn't expressing the insulin gene. So all the new beta cells that would form from a stem cell would not be blue. That is, would be yellow in this picture. That's what would happen if the pancreas were like the blood or the skin. There would be a constant replacement. However, the way we do the marking experiment, which is a genetic and a permanent change to the genome at time zero, all of the blue cells, if they were to divide, give rise to more blue cells. So if we look at the upper right and imagine that those blue and yellow cells are slowly going to be dying off, and then consider that the ones that remain can divide to give rise to more cells that are either blue or yellow, whichever one they started off at, in model two, you would get maintenance by beta cell duplication. So the two extremes then are maintenance by stem cells or maintenance by the differentiated cell itself dividing. Here's what it looks like in the real experimental result. You can see in brown the staining for the protein insulin. All of the cells in these two little islets, one is bigger than the other, would be expressing insulin. But the dark blue ones have also been genetically marked. So they're really blue plus brown, although you can't see the brown because the blue is so strong. So this marks the cells about, and the important point here is half of the cells are marked at time zero at the pulse. And you can see it's very specific. Looking at a section through the pancreas, the ducts and the exocrine tissue aren't marked. It's only these little raisins or islets within the pancreas which get marked. So in our experiment then, we mark the cells and wait a year. 
Now, a year is a pretty long time because we're anxious to know the result. This is in a mouse. But in you, it would be as if I labeled your beta cells now and then came back when you were 45 years old. That would be the relative equivalent for how long we're waiting in a mouse. And ask what happened in your pancreas during that you know, 30 to 40, 30 year period. Well, the answer here is visually quite obvious. At the pulse and the chase, there is no change in the proportion of beta cells that are labeled. 100% of the islets contain labeled cells at both times, and the proportion remains constant. This supports the conclusion, then, that the pancreas is not maintained by a stem cell, but by, you could say, a simpler mechanism where fully differentiated cells divide to give rise to more of the same. Now, you might think, well, then what's the big deal? Why is it a problem? Why does it matter if a, cell, if a tissue uses a stem cell or not? Well, in this case, it matters at a minimum from the medical point of view, because in diseases where the differentiated cells are lost, or in the case of injury, if there's no stem cell, then the body has no capacity to replace or replenish itself. So here you see in the case where in type 1 or juvenile diabetes, when the pancreatic beta cells are destroyed by the immune system, that patient then has no source of cells to replace the missing ones. Where are we at this point? There are two mechanisms for replacing tissues in an animal, stem cells and the division of differentiated cells. But these stem cells are the ones that have attracted our attention because they both teach us something about normal development and differentiation, but also because of their potential for clinical applications. And I'm going to finish up by talking about stem cells, and in particular, a special stem cell called an embryonic stem cell. There are two places, then, that stem cells can be derived or be found. In the adult, on the far right, I've already given you an example of the blood, and I talked a bit about the skin. Those cells are called multipotent because they can give rise to a few cell types, but not all the cells of the body. So, for example, a blood stem cell gives rise to blood. On the left is the cell I want to draw your attention to now. That is an embryonic stem cell, which comes from that early stage of development we saw in our first movie, the blastocyst stage. These cells are described as totipotent, tota as in total, meaning that they can form any cell type in the body. So just to emphasize that point, there are two kinds. The embryonic, which have the greatest potential, can form all cell types, grow forever in culture, and are very plentiful. And adult stem cells, which are harder to find and harder to isolate, but can still be very useful. And Nadia will be describing their use, for example, in replenishing muscle. Well, where do these embryonic stem cells come from? In this slide, I describe for you how they are derived. They come from the early blastocyst stage using the inner cell mast cells, which are those cells that haven't yet made decisions about whether they'll be ectoderm, mesoderm, or endoderm. The inner cell mass is dissected out of the blastocyst and put into a petri dish, which has a feeder layer or a nourishing layer, layer of cells on the bottom. Some of those cells are capable of becoming embryonic stem cells, as shown here, and then they grow into colonies or cultures. We call them lines because, like a, a line or a breed of dogs, they all derive from an original uh, progenitor, and we keep them growing in culture. I'm going to show you a movie now about the derivation of these cells. And at the end of the movie, it's going to show one of their properties, which is that by adding factors, growth factors or other signals, we can begin to tell the cells what to do. In general, however, if one removes the culture conditions which allow the cells to just self-renew, to make more of themselves, because remember, these are stem cells, the cells without those signals for self-renewal will just spontaneously differentiate will start to become different kinds of tissues. And I'll show you an example of that as well. Can we have the movie, please? Here you see then the inner cell mast cells, which are going to be removed and grown in a Petri dish. We first remove the outer layer that would uh, normally form the placenta. Here the cells are put into a Petri dish. Usually there are mouse embryonic fibroblasts on the bottom of it to help the cells grow. Most of them don't survive, but a few do, and can grow into colonies of cells, as you'll see here. So this, then, is that process of self-renewal. The cells can continually self-renew, and in fact, they are immortal in culture. They can be grown like this forever. Some mouse embryonic stem cells growing now in the lab were derived more than 30 years ago, so they long outlived the life of the animal from 